everyone to Sonoma Brain Trust. I'm Mary Piasta with Hauser, Veluzzo and Piasta. And I have my co-host here, Chelsea Runnings with Better Homes and Gardens and Darren Blonsky with Sonoma Wealth Advisors. And we are delighted to have the president of the Sonoma Valley School Board, in addition to lawyer extraordinaire and a local dad on our little YouTube show today, John Kelly. So John, thank you so much for being here with us. And can you enlighten us about what is going on with schools? And do we get to send them back anytime soon? Please. No, Darren, do not. So there's the most important answer right away. Uh, Hi, and thanks for having me, guys. Um, so you put my uh, roles in reverse order of the way I think about them and importance. I start with Dad, Mary. Yeah. I yeah. know, but we're like, you know, this is, we're talking about schools, so we'll just, but you know, yes, of course, Dad is primary, right? <laughs> As a dad, though, I sympathize with all of you, uh, you know, in our parent roles, uh, because we want to send the kids back. And I mean, it's been too long already. The problem is we need to, as a community, help the schools out in this circumstance. We always tend to think about what are the schools doing and how do we benefit from it? But this is the, really the reverse of that. We have to crush the curve. And that is the curve of infections on COVID because we can't run public schools in a pandemic. It just doesn't work. The safety issues are massive. We have vulnerable staff, we have vulnerable teachers. And then even if students themselves might be a bit more resilient to COVID, they go home to families that are not and they can easily convey. So it's just, it's not, Every, every place in the world that's tried to reopen in the middle of the pandemic has had terrible results from, from, uh, from schools being spread sites. And I, the latest one, Israel this morning, opened up. They had a very successful uh, crushing of the curve. People were wearing their damn masks. They were washing their hands. They weren't doing backyard birthday parties and barbecues. They got the rate of infection down, and then they opened up elementary schools, and boom, there it went. So we need everybody to do their part on fighting the pandemic, and then we can open the schools up. Right now, we think November 16th is the first date that we would open in Sonoma Valley. Um, that was at our last board meeting. Um, we're going to meet again on Saturday at 9 a.m. Um, we'll be talking more about this. We'll be talking about this at every board meeting for the foreseeable future. Um, but the, the long and short of it is the community really holds the keys to the schoolhouse right now. Once the community can crush the curve, we can open the doors. Fair enough. Easy enough. Um, <laughs> well, it opens up a whole set of other questions right away. Like, well, let's, talk about so let's, let's define crush the curve, right? Because I think that's the, 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 uh, the debate is what does it mean to crush the curve? And isn't this just a flu? Well, should we just get over this and move on with life? How does the school district look at this? You know, that's a great question. Because, um, I mean, in the early days, we thought it was kind of like the flu. And, of course, what we really found out is we have no idea what this thing is. Uh, we really don't know the long-term consequences. Uh, for example, it looks like about four in five people that are hospitalized have long-term psychiatric consequences from the COVID infection. And we don't really know what that's going to look like a couple years out. Um, so we, we, are, we are in a situation where we are flying a plane and we're basically flying it on instruments. Um, I can remember when I was about, oh, 13 years old, I went on a school trip to Washington, DC. And we flew United, so on the flight back, we landed in Denver before we came back to San Francisco International. And as we flew into Denver, it was nighttime and it was a snowstorm. And it was, for a 13 year old boy, that was a really exciting thing. It was like, wow, you know, this guy, this pilot's gonna put the, put the plane on the ground in really bad circumstances. As an older person now, I don't like those exciting landings. I don't want us flying on instruments. I want us to know exactly what's going on ahead of time. And we just don't. So that's the biggest problem we face. But what are we gonna do because of that, right? Because not opening school is not the end of the conversation. It's the start. So we've got to implement pretty robust protocols to make sure that we can support continued learning through this. And that's what we call distance learning 2.0. So, in the, in the spring, we had a lot of frustrated people because we've had to implement in five working days an entirely new way of teaching students. And that happened over spring break because um, we did not reopen after spring break. And as expected, everyone was dissatisfied. No one, no one more than teachers. Um, you talk to a kindergarten teacher, they want to be at story time. They want to have those kids on their knee, right? They, they like, that's why they do what they do. So we didn't implement grades and we didn't take attendance and we basically tried to make it as receptive as we could to encourage people to participate. 
lessons have been learned. We have had three months of summer now to work on this. Distance Learning 2.0 is graded, attendance is taken, the metrics are different, accountability has been put in place. So we're going to make sure that we can implement as much education between now and November 16th as we can. Okay, 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 hold on. What about the like economic divide and the families, you know, like at schools you're really familiar with where some people don't even have internet. So like how, what is distance learning going to look like for those families? Or parents that aren't home to help. Or kids who don't speak English. I mean, John, where are the answers here? Well, it's great because, you know, immediately the edge and corner cases show up, right? So we can have, uh, let's say, a first grader that is an English language learner without an internet connection living in a house with seven people where they may have responsibilities for taking care of a younger sibling. They can't even get a quiet room. They don't even have their own room. So our entire paradigm of how that works is different. There's a bunch of things we've done to address these problems. The Education Foundation, in partnership with the district, right last March, went and distributed cellular internet connections to students across the valley. And it was paid for by private money. And it was a really uh, nice example of public-private partnership to address a particular corner case, which was the internet just wasn't there. But th there's other issues that go with it. Um, what happens if you are, say, an essential worker or even more so a first responder as we head into fire season, and you absolutely have to have childcare. So we have a separate program established at our school sites to allow essential workers and first responders to actually have children taken care of at school and learn at school. So that is one of the, one of the edge cases that we've addressed. We're having to do the same thing with special education. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't do special education across a Chromebook. It doesn't work, okay? I mean, the kids are having problems with actually interacting with the device, right? And, and the last thing you need if you're on spectrum is more screen time. So we have actually had to address that particular corner case as well. And there's a whole series of these. I mean, we, we have to recognize that distance learning, even distance learning 2.0, at its very best, that is if we implement it with fidelity and rigor, it's about half as effective as in-classroom instruction, even at its best, right? But this is the, all we can do during COVID. So we've got to get off of distance learning as fast as we can. Um, even, even though we're addressing the corner and edge cases, uh, it's just limited the amount that we can do. And then we have to reflect upon what are we going to do when we do come back? Because I realize there's a lot of optimism about a vaccine and Project Warp Speed, the government's uh, rapid vaccine development, definitely what the government should have done under these circumstances, but the vaccine might be 50% effective. 50%, it's pretty low. So even if we have that, that's not gonna solve the problem. Um, so if we come back, in, uh, come back in November, we're gonna have to have PPE for everyone. Um, we're going to have to have cleaning, uh, personal protective equipment. We're gonna be looking at uh, cleaning the schools three times a day. So we've got uh, extra custodial. Um, we are looking at implementing in the classrooms at distance between the students, um, protective shields. Um, we are purchasing and renting extra structures, temporary tent-like structures, so that we can have additional space available. Um, and it's going to cost between 2 and $5 million at, at a minimum to get that done for the next school so year. Where is that funding coming from? Yeah. Is that like a general, from a general fund, the county, or what? Federal so the county is completely unhelpful on any of this. Um, now, there is emergency funding coming, right, from the federal government and the state. But the thing is, is that implementing that takes time. So what you really have to be able to do as a district is get the program in place, pay for it, and then look for reimbursement. And fortunately, our school district can do that. So we're running at 22% reserves right now, about $12 million. And that's a change of about $12 million in the last two years, because we were in a place where we were expected to be at zero reserves right now. And... In 2017 and 2018, we took the tough decisions. Um, we got a hold of our benefits issues with our unions, and we managed to find ways for less expensive programs that got them the same services. And we were able to implement some pay raises at the same time, 11.5% for our teachers over the last three years. But in doing so, we managed to restore our reserves. So we're coming into this, it's like going into a storm, right? Do you want your boat to have a lot of water in it already when you go in, or do you want to be riding high? Because you don't. But we are coming into it with healthy reserves. So we can, if we have to spend $10 million this year to deal with COVID, that's the highest number I've heard put out there is 10 million. We have the money. We can do it. Um, but now we're going to need to go get reimbursed for it. But, uh, but we can do it. And that has to do with some of Valley's unique situation, which I think a lot of your clients are aware of, which is this happens to be a very wealthy community. It doesn't necessarily have the biggest, strongest economic base, but it has a lot of people that live in Sonoma Valley who are self-employed or distance workers for other businesses and they property taxes they pay quite a bit so we are what is called a basic aid district we are funded by local property taxes 
not by, uh, not by the normal state distribution under what's called the local control funding formula. So we actually get more money per student than most districts, and that's going to make the difference in COVID. So I don't have kids. Um, my cousin you have dogs. I have dogs. <laughs> I don't have any friends Congratulations on your good decision making, Chelsea. <laughs> um, but a lot of my friends have kids, my cousins have kids, and I hear a lot of them are weighing the pros and cons of distance learning versus homeschooling for those parents who can stay home. Are you experiencing a lot of fall off in actual students who are staying on or that's a great well, question talk about that personally too maybe like as working parents i mean what's what, what's your view on this john you can you can give us the whole picture well i mean let's start with the simplest you know i'm in my office right now working and my daughter sienna is in the next office and she is uh doing some independent study work as well as helping us with legal work right so i mean i'm i'm doing what most working parents are which is trying to find a way to cope um, now, as far as the district's concerned, there's two things that we know right away. One, fewer students are going to come back. That is, we are not going to have the same enrollment. There's a variety of reasons why, but we're just going to be down about 10 to 15 percent in student numbers. For a district that already had declining enrollment, we were around 3,700 students. You know, that's about 400 or 500 students we expect to not be coming back in in the next class. They're going a variety of places. The district's always had independent study. IS is the abbreviation they use in the jargon of education speak. And uh, there's been an explosion of interest in that. So there's over 400 students that want to engage in IS. And my family, we've looked at it too. Distance learning is in theory until the schools can reopen. Those, and it is uh, still teacher directed. Independent study is parent directed. You do check in with teachers during the week, but it is a parent directed effort. And if you do IS, you do it for the whole year. So there won't be anyone coming back. One of the old issues with IS was uh, there were issues relating to uh, sports. Uh, and that was one of the reasons parents didn't want to do it. That's not a problem right now. There are no sports. Um, and we as a district are going to be flexible on that one and try to make sure that IS students still can, if we do bring sports back, participate. So that's one of the resolutions on that. Sort of a narrow resolution, but, but we did get somewhere on that. But frankly, parents are desperate. And they've been looking to any school they can to try to find a place to send their kids. And so we know that uh, private schools and charters have been getting a lot of inquiries about, you know, can we place our students there? They are under the exact same conditions we are. Uh, they are required to be closed while we're on the watch list. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no loophole there. Um, and they're going to go through the same. Tell a certain school about that. I mean, I don't even get me started, John. Like, seriously. <laughs> Well, I tend to get enough people upset with me with my school board work, and I'm not going to get involved with private schools. I'll leave that to someone else. That's a, an or that they can uh, labor over. Um, right, but, uh, but no, it's, it's John, a public. Can I loop you back on something real quick? Um, sure. Accountability, right? Because that, that, that was an interesting word you used earlier. And, you know, I think that th there's a lot there. And um, I'm curious how the school district looks at accountability. How are they going to look at grades? How are they going to look at... Um, advancement for kids because some are going to get the learning some are just not and so they're gonna have to reset in some degree when we go back I think that's right you know and focusing on accountability is just smart because it's built into our governance structures we have a local control accountability plan or LCAP it's a jargon that's thrown around and it really is the way that we make sure that we spend our money in a fashion that's consistent with our educational objectives so we actually have to make sure that we're holding people accountable Accountability applies to more than students. Like that's always what we think of first, but accountability is how is the institution accountable? How is the district accountable? So there was, there were, there is a, uh, we're making sure that for example, our teachers are offering instruction during school hours. Um, we're making sure that we are tracking when our teachers are working. So it has the rigor of a workplace that we expect. Um, it applies to students making sure that they are in fact logged in, that if they're not, that we start activating what we would characterize as the truancy mechanisms. So it, statutorily there's work that we have to do to make sure that students are actually doing, they're coming to school in normal circumstances. And if it's distance learning, we have to make sure they're logging in, right? So we have accountability mechanisms to make sure students are doing that. But accountability goes even, even farther than that. It has to do with making sure that the money is spent properly and inconsistently with our budgeted objectives, right? And the hard thing is as an emergency, money just gets spent which is fine, especially in the opening days of an emergency. And a lot of that happened in March, April, and May. Now we're adjusting to a new normal. And so we're going to be making sure that money is being spent appropriately. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a fully equipped classroom? We know what it looks like when it's in a room, right? But the students can't go into a classroom to, for example, use art supplies right now. 
Are we going to make sure that the money is spent appropriately so that they have the materials at home they can work with? And what about a teacher? They need to outfit, in some instances, a home office. Do they have the ability to do so? Are we tracking how that money is spent and making sure it's done right? And then we have a further problem, which just comes back to the really nice thing Mary brought up earlier, which is internet connections. Everybody needs better ones. Sonoma Valley's internet architecture is at least 20 years old. It's behind the times. One of the things we as a school district have done is in conjunction with the Education Foundation and Sustainable Sonoma, Supervisor Gorin's office, Sonic.net, uh, uh, is investigated the possibility of using the public right of way to run high speed fiber through the northern part of what we call the Springs. So from Boys Boulevard to Agua Caliente. Um, if we could do that and then extend fiber off to say mm, even 100 yards either side of the roadway, we would address about two thirds of our student connectivity problems um, because there's just a density of students living in that area. It, it's uncanny how bad internet is in the valley. I have an office right off the square and I have a satellite on top because Comcast wants to charge me 40 grand to run a line in. Like I'm right off the square. It's unbelievable. Yeah. If we can resolve the connectivity issues for our most vulnerable students and most in need, ironically, we may have put in place a scaffolding whereby we can solve this for the very entrepreneurial population we have in Sonoma. There are all kinds of clients of all of us that live in beautiful hillside properties around the valley who struggle with crappy internet connections that are vital to them doing their jobs. And if we can resolve this issue in the springs, we might start being able to resolve the issue for everybody else too. So it's all about taking these opportunities that the COVID situation presents, right? And translating them into success for the future. And on that note, I wanna, I wanna give one small anecdote I've picked up in all this that I think we all might find interesting. Um, there have been some positive consequences of COVID. Premature births during the shutdown were down 90%. Yeah, New York Times article about this about a week and a half ago. That has been one of the most stubborn health issues for two or three generations. There has been no progress on premature births. And as we all know, that can, uh, if it's very premature, it can have very negative consequences from an educational and developmental perspective. You can remediate them, but it's, it's anything we can do to address that has great public health consequences. Nobody knows why. We have no idea why the shutdown got rid of that. Maybe it was everyone was sitting in home on their couch, right? Maybe, yeah, bed rest. <laughs> maybe there was less uh, infection going on from other seasonal flus or other kinds of stuff like that. Maybe there was just less stress. It's hard to believe there was less stress if you're stuck at home with your kids, yeah. but Hey, right. Um, the upshot of it is we, f we had a natural experiment and we just found out that an extraordinarily stubborn problem, one that if somebody had gotten these kind of results, we would have given them the Nobel prize in medicine for and we got it just on accident. And it was, it's been worldwide. It's been spotted in, in, in a variety of countries and the data's collabor uh, corroborated across the different jurisdictions. So it's, there's things that are gonna come out of this that are new that are good. Um, and maybe we can do some of that regarding connectivity. I think we've kind of touched on that in some of our past episodes, just trying to make some, maybe solve some issues that we had prior to this that are really becoming you know, noticeable or really obvious right now, maybe we'll take the time to really try to fix those, those problems. I'm so optimistic, Chelsea. And then the problem always, of course, is people love things to just kind of stay the way they are, right? It's getting people excited about change is really tough. Um, and, but this is one of those circumstances where people's minds, I think, have been opened. Um, and that's happened to us as a school district on a bunch of fronts. Um, we've, you know, Black Lives Matters has come right in the middle of all this. And we have, a school district are re-examining every single disciplinary thing we do. Um, you know, there are a number of school districts that have implemented what they call restorative practices, which is a way to sort of reweave the fabric that gets broken when you have a discipline issue or a conflict issue in a school. It doesn't work for everything. Um, restorative practices don't help with racism because you're putting the oppressor in a conflict situation with the person that they were attacking. It doesn't work with domestic violence, but it does work with a lot of educational issues. And so the district is looking at, during this period of time, how can we implement restorative practices? At the same time, we've got that, we've got a lot of complaints about the fact that we use police officers in our schools. We do, we have a school resource officer. And there is very sincere complaint from our community that that is the wrong way to run a school. And we're looking at that now, and we're gonna have to take the time to do it um, because Old paradigms are not working. Um, Los Angeles Unified went from school policing to restorative practices and they reduced their uh, discipline issues by about 60%. It was incredible. 
Um, so Sonoma Valley may be able to get some of the benefit from that. Maybe another place some new thinking might help. Is there a resource page that parents or anybody who's maybe looking to move to Sonoma can look up what's going on within the school, what the school's doing for distance learning? Is there somewhere they can get some information at? So that's a really great question. Um, you know, Lorna Sheridan at the Index Tribune has long run a column about educational issues, what's, what's going on. And she's been a great resource in the past. Um, her focus is a bit broader than just public education. Um, we've had, uh, we had in the past a page that we actually paid for as a district to get information out. The problem was is we had problems getting a really good uh, community volunteer that wanted to be that, uh, be that person that would be the funnel for information um, that could commit to doing that. And so we do need to find somebody that really is eager to write that for us. So the, the thing with communications is the, the most effective form of communications are, that we've ever found as a school district is one parent talking to another parent. Uh, that, is the, that is the absolute uh, strongest way. So if uh, somebody coming to the community wants to find out what's going on with our schools, I would immediately put them in touch with the PTO for the, uh, for the uh, elementary district that they're moving into, elementary area. Um, and the Prestwood uh, PTO is fantastic on this. That's the person to talk to. And they've had a collaborative relationship with some of our realtors over the years, um, including some realtors committing a portion of some of, their, uh, some of their sales going back to that school. But uh, the PTOs at all of our sites are very strong and they're willing to work on this uh, with, our, with, our, with our families. Cool. Well, John, thank you so much. You really shed a lot of light on something that I think has been on everyone's mind. I know it's been stressing my cousin out who sends her kids to a private school in Petaluma and I'm listening to all my friends and my two co-hosts and my cousins like on a daily basis about the stress of not knowing what's going on. So thank you for taking time today to really share with us what it's gonna take to crush the curve, get the kids back into school and the measures that you guys are taking to ensure that they're getting the best education possible. Wear your damn masks. Thanks so much, Chelsea, we really appreciate it. And thank you, Mary and Darren. Really nice to see you all and I hope you guys have a great day. All right, you too. You too. Thanks, John. Yeah.